Hello, welcome to Morning Sun Herb Farm. My name is Rose Laval. I own Morning Sun Herb Farm, a small specialty nursery located in Northern California. Join me for week five of our eight week All About Herbs series. The first week, we spoke about basils. Week two, we talked about the five essential herbs of the garden. In week three, we looked at container gardening and raised beds with herbs. Last week, we talked about the lemony herbs, and this week, we're gonna talk about ethnic herbs. Ethnic herbs are those herbs that have become more popular lately because uh, we just are finding that we're doing a more diverse type of uh, cooking, and we like to grow a lot more of the herbs where we can actually use them right in our gardens. I like to start with probably my favorite one because people always learn a lot from this one ugly little, or uninteresting I should say, little green plant that I've got growing right down here. So cilantro, we know cilantro, many of us love cilantro. If you're growing cilantro in inland California, you realize that cilantro never survives the summer. You always think it's you, but I'm here to assure you, it's not you, it's the cilantro. Cilantro likes temperatures that are temperate, so below 90 degrees, and nice high humidity. So you put us in Central California with 95, 100 degree days in June, and very low humidity, and cilantro turns yellow, sends out a big frilly uh, plume of foliage, and dies. And we always think, oh, it's, it's me, I've killed it. It's just the temperature and it's the way cilantro grows. But I'm here to tell you there is an amazing substitute for cilantro and it is called Vietnamese coriander. Polygonum odoratum, Vietnamese coriander, rau rum is another common name for it, Korean mint. It's very easy to grow. Um, it is a polygonum, so those of you that have a little background in plants are going to go knotweed. It's the knotweed family. It'll grow everywhere. And in fact, a lot of knotweeds will grow from these joints here. So the first thing I always tell people about growing the cilantro substitute is that you're not going to put it in your best, loveliest soil of the raised bed. You're going to put it in kind of a crummy spot in a little bit of afternoon shade unless you're on the coast or someplace where it's not 100 degree temperatures during the daytime. So here I've got my rau rum, Vietnamese coriander, growing in an area that's a little bit shady. It's being shaded by another plant, by a big butterfly bush. And it's in an area that doesn't get a whole lot of water. If you keep your knotweed, a little bit dry, it doesn't spread quickly across the ground. So here it gets watered really just once a week. Um, and if you keep it in a container, that's another good way to keep it kind of in check. If you're growing this somewhere where you get a lot of natural summer rain, like in the Midwest, you definitely it's better in a container. It's also not gonna be winter hardy below zone eight. So for those of you who are in a snow area, you'll bring this inside in the winter and it actually does great as a house plant. So what is the difference between Vietnamese coriander and cilantro? Well, first of all, it survives in the summertime. We love that. Second of all, and I think this is a real pro to this plant, a lot of people complain about cilantro because it has that little bit of soapy flavor to it that not everyone picks up on, but for some people's palates, they really taste it. This has no soapiness to it. It has a little teeny bit of citrus, kind of delicious that way. And it's a tiny bit, I don't want to call it spicy, but it's got a little undertone of uh, some, something like cloves. It's actually easy to use. Um, you would use it just like cilantro. You would take that mid rib out though, if you're using it fresh. You get that wonderful cilantro flavor. So if you're using it for traditional uh, Vietnamese, Thai, Korean, Cambodian, Laotian food, this is a common thing that you're going to find in there. If you're using it for your um, South American or Mexican cuisine, it's a great substitute during the summer. It means you don't have to go to the store 
buy a tiny bit of cilantro, let most of it turn to mush in your refrigerator just to get that one tablespoon. You can actually use this plant as a substitute. It is not on its own a particularly fabulously beautiful plant, so you can always add it to something where you, it's got something uh, producing some flowers because you won't find a lot of flowers on this plant. Sometimes just a little white flower is all you get. However, when people discover that there is a summer substitute for cilantro so that they can continue to come out and harvest for their salsas, for all their Mexican cuisine, and maybe to start doing a little bit more Asian cooking, they were, uh, it's amazing because it's just, it's easy to grow. It's easy to add to your garden. It's a great container plant. Even in a container, I would grow it in a little bit of afternoon shade. Um, and it's just, it's, it's hassle-free. So it's a great plant. It doesn't have a lot of insects that bother it. Um, again, if you keep it a little bit on the dry side, it won't tend to spread. Um, otherwise it can spread a little bit, sort of like a mint, but uh, easy to keep in check. Just put it in kind of crummy soil, put it in a little bit of shade, and don't water it too much. So again, this is the one plant that when people realize they can do a summer substitute for cilantro, super exciting, especially something that's easy to grow and will live from year to year. So once you've got it, you've got it forever. Probably the hottest new herb that we are finding we're using this year is shiso, Perella frutescens. So I've grown this plant for many years and usually I sell six and I throw away a hundred and then I grow a hundred more and I sell six and throw the rest away. But this year, 2020, this plant has become the hottest new herb to use in the kitchen. Shiso is also called uh, just Perella. It's called beefsteak plant. I don't know why. Or it's called Japanese basil. So it comes in a lot of different colors. This first one here with the green leaf is the most common color and the one that's used the most. Now when you read about what it tastes like, the fun thing about herbs is that it, they take on a lot of wine characteristics as far as their descriptions. So it, one person will say it's kind of citrusy woodsy and the next person says it's kind of clove cinnamony and the next person goes it's bitter so you get lots of different possibilities people do use this to make kind of an interesting pesto it has a flavor mm, i wouldn't call it anything like basil to me it it does have a tiny undertone of bitter, but remember bitter is one of those things that you should include in your kitchen. But it does have, to me, a citrusy flavor. It's those big leaves you may see if you are a, a lover of sushi, you may see it as one of the things that hold the wasabi on the plate better than those weird little plastic green things that they sometimes use. Or you may see it actually underneath pieces of sushi. If you find this on your platter of sushi, you want to roll it over the top of the sushi and actually eat the whole leaf with your sushi. It has that wonderful, to me, little bit of citrusy flavor to it. Kind of a nice, clean, with just a little undertone of, I don't want to say bitterness, but kind of a bitterness. So this, this plant now is used not just for stir fry and Japanese food, it's being incorporated into everything. The most recent thing I've seen it in is a mojito. So a shiso mojito. And when you can no longer say shiso mojito, you've had enough. So use this for all of the different kinds of things that um, maybe you'd use basil for. It is in the same family as basil. It is a mint family member. And you can tell because it's got that weird square stem. So square stem is in the mint family. It won't spread like mint, however. It doesn't spread underground. And for most of us, if you are not in a tropical area, it will be an annual. So this is a plant that we grow here just for the summer. So the mildest flavored one and the most commonly used is the green shiso. The red shiso is gorgeous and it actually does dye different kinds of fabrics and it will dye different kinds of food and it will dye your adult beverage. So if you want your adult beverage to take on that beet red color, you can use it that way. The leaf is a little bit um, 
uh, more fleshy than the green one. So the red shiso has a little more strength to it and a little bit more, to me, of what I would call that clove flavor. So again, uh, this might make a really interesting pesto. Maybe not for um, regular noodles, but maybe for soba noodles, or maybe to do um, with your sushi, a little bit extra for sushi, or in a soup, some sort of a ramen, it would be wonderful. The leaves can be stir fried, and the leaves can be sort of uh, used almost like a spinach substitute also. This one is called Korean shiso. And I love this because green on top, red on the bottom. Totally beautiful. Even if you're just growing this one as an ornamental plant in your garden, how lovely is this? So this plant's gonna get to be about two feet tall. Like I said, even if you didn't use it for cooking, how gorgeous. But what if you're using it to wrap up uh, a piece of shrimp, like in a salad or like an appetizer? and you're wrapping it up around, wow, you get some really great coloration on it that way. Beautiful plant. Finally, we have one called Perella Magella. And I mean, you just like to say that, Perella Magella. This one is often thought to be a coleus, but it's not at all. It is a member of the Shiso genus. So this is a perella. You can cook with this. This one is one that I personally call bitter. You see it's putting on its little flower right now. But look at that in the garden. Look how stunning that is just to have some prettiness. And if you were looking for, you know, an edible garnish to put on your plate in the summertime, you just can't beat that leaf color. It's fabulous. Where I've planted these, especially this perella magella, where I've planted these is gonna get a little bit of afternoon shade. So they get nice morning sun, in the afternoon they're gonna get some shade. These can go in full sun, but if you're in a really hot area, like where we are here in Vacaville, I tend to put these in a little bit more shade in the afternoon if it's possible. Like basils, shisos need a lot more water and a lot more fertilizer. So you wanna make sure that you're watering and fertilizing these plants regularly. So you're going to be watering them in a pot, perhaps as much as once a day, because these get big, they get up to two feet tall. In the ground, you're going to be watering them probably twice or even three times a week, depending how hot and how much sun they're in. You're also going to want to fertilize them at least once a month in a pot every two weeks. Do keep them pinched back, so if you're not using them, make sure you clip off at least the top couple sets of leaves. And again, I'm a gardener, so I don't have any fingernails to easily clip. So cut them back. You see how much I even cut this back, just so that you can keep it nice and bushy and low and you keep it with new foliage. Because just like the basils, the old foliage after a while loses all of that flavor. It just becomes uh, waxy and kind of bitter flavored. So make sure you're always trying to produce new, beautiful leaves and you can take these older leaves, use it for an edible garnish. This looks like it's headed for a, a drink of some kind, doesn't it? Just beautiful. A lot of people include these in the garden, even if they're not gonna cook with them because they are truly uh, beautiful looking specimen plants in your, in your herb garden. Here we've got two beautiful garden friends. We've got that beautiful little jumping spider. Of course, he's great for taking care of insects. And also right next to him here, we have a soldier beetle. And so these guys look super mean, and uh, they are. If you were an aphid, you would think they were really mean because they are amazing aphid eaters. So if you see these guys in your garden, do not squish them. These are the good guys in your garden. They look mean, but again, if you were a tiny little aphid or a little thrip or a white fly, you'd be scared right now. But we can be happy that he's visiting our plant. We've discussed lemongrass in two parts of our series already, but you have to mention it when you're talking about ethnic herbs. Lemongrass has become one of our most popular herbs to sell here at the nursery. People use it for the traditional reason you'd think, which is curries, Asian food, um, Thai food, but also Indian cuisine. And people love to use it for all kinds of tea making. We discussed already kind of how to grow it. This is in our raised bed. It does super well in a raised bed. 
In this raised bed, it's in pretty much full sun all day long. The nice thing about lemongrass though, it's super adaptable. So this could be in a part shade bed, it could be in a large pot, it could be in the ground, it could be watered every three days, it could be watered once a week. It's adaptable down to all kinds of possibilities. It is not cold hardy below about 20 degrees, so if you're someplace that gets colder than 20 degrees, you'll need to be able to bring it inside during the winter. It's another one of those plants that would be okay as a house plant for much of the winter. We cut this back a few weeks ago when we were talking about container gardening. Gave it to the donkeys, remember? So now it's starting to put its growth back on and you can see how quickly it puts new growth on. So remember with your herbs, they usually like to be pruned heavily. So the lemongrass we cut way back. We're already getting a lot of nice new, beautiful fronds from it. Again, we'd use the top part for tea making. We'd use the bottom part to actually do most of our cuisine. It's easy to take a piece off and to use this bottom portion here for cooking. So the actual cooking part is just this part right in here. Remember, this is very fibrous. So if you're going to use it for, um, you know, cooking a curry or something like that, you're going to want to remove it because it's never going to be edible unless you're a donkey and can really break it down. But for the rest of us, we're going to take those pieces out before we actually serve our curry dishes. It can be made into small chunks and actually make a really fine tea blend also. And a lot of people will actually dry these. They'll cut them up, they'll dry this, and they'll include this in a tea blend because it has a stronger punch of lemon than the leaves will. So again, lemongrass, everyone thinks it's tropical, it's impossible to grow, super easy to grow. In some areas of the country, it's going to be an annual unless you bring it inside during the winter time. Now we're gonna talk about oregano. And remember, we spoke about oregano couple of sessions back when we were talking about it as an essential herb and one of the things I mentioned about oregano then was that oregano is a flavor it's not a plant this is one of our two Mexican oreganos this is Lipia graviolens closely related to my favorite herb on the planet lemon verbena native to Mexico and Central America especially the drier portions this is an oregano that is truly spicy. So when you eat this oregano, and you'll notice a lot of people actually use it dry rather than fresh, but a fresh Mexican oregano is really hot. It's really spicy. It's a lot, I need a beer now. It's uh, very hot and spicy. It's what you like to use though for your salsas, for all of your Mexican cuisine. So if something calls for oregano in a Mexican cookbook, this is what it's looking for, probably. This one again is in a raised bed. It's not quite as winter hardy as its cousin lemon verbena. So I have lost this before when we dropped below about 22 degrees. Remember when we were talking about container gardening back in week two, three, uh, we actually pruned this plant way back. So I had pruned it here and here and back in here. And you can see how quickly it's growing back in. It's actually the perfect example of why you want to prune back your herbs. Because remember, it was leggy, kind of ugly looking, not very prolific with leaves. I pruned off all that old stuff. And now we have tons of beautiful new foliage. So remember, the best foliage, the best foliage to use for um, cooking is fully open, mature leaves that are still young and haven't been sitting there for months and months. So really use this plant if you're doing any sort of um, Mexican or Central American cooking. It's also a beautiful plant in the garden. Later on, this plant will get up to about three feet tall, covered with little white flowers. So it's a good edible flower also if you're looking for a spicy flower to add to it add to some cuisine, this would be a great one to add. Easy to grow, but remember if you're someplace that's kind of cold at, during the wintertime, you're going to want to bring it indoors. 
We want to look at its other uh, possibility though for Mexican oregano, which is completely different in its growing habit. So we'll take a look at that next. So the second possibility for Mexican oregano is a plant that looks completely different called Poliomentha longiflora. This is a plant that's also called rosemary mint because it actually has a little bit more minty flavor to it and a little more rosemary flavor to it. So it has oregano flavor, not so spicy, more cooling like a mint, and it has a completely different flower. This is the flower just starting to come out right now, this light purple flower. So interestingly, it's a great hummingbird plant. This is super hardy. This little guy has been living here uh, for about six years now. Winter and summer, it looks the same. So it's, it's winter hardy here and it's an evergreen in our climate here in Northern California. It can go down to at least 20, uh, 20 degrees, probably even a little colder before you get any damage on the leaves or before it defoliates. So very different looking and here we have it growing in a little shade. It actually prefers some afternoon shade if you're in a really hot climate. Very different. Again, I wish that as part of this series, I wish we could do a scratch and sniff and you could actually smell the other side of your screen. So this Mexican oregano isn't hot at all. It's got this cool mintiness to it added to an oregano flavor and then a little hint of rosemary. Very, very different. So depending where you are in Mexico, you're going to use a different oregano plant as well. So this Mexican oregano I like to do in containers because it's so pretty all summer. And this is just beginning to come into bloom. As you're looking down here, all of these right here, these are all the flower buds. And in about another month, hopefully by the end of this series, we can come back and take a look at it. It will be just covered with these purple flowers. And now that I've gotten the chance to show you what the purple flower looks like, I'm going to come back in and I'm going to do my favorite thing and I'm going to eat that flower. Oh my gosh, it's sweet. So now it's sweet, minty, rosemary, oregano flavor. So how great it would be to have a quesadilla or something you're trying to maybe kind of make look a little prettier. You can put those flowers on top of it and you get this yummy little kick of sweet but still oregano flavor. So again, it's another reminder, if you can eat the leaves, you can eat the flowers and you're gonna get a little bit different texture. So all these other flowers that are coming on here, if the hummingbirds don't get to them, I tend to come by every day and munch a couple. Really wonderful. Again, you get a tiny bit of heat like oregano, but nothing like the leaves of the other Mexican oregano where it actually numbs your tongue, it's so strong. This is one of those plants, even if you're not using it for Mexican uh, cooking, people love to use it to add it to a lot of their uh, salads, for example, or in soups, because it has this certain complexity about it. You know, to get mint and oregano and that rosemary all together, it's really delicious. Um, we use it in a butter. So if you're using it on a, oh, yeah, a butter for corn, this is fabulous. So a little bit of salt, a little bit of chili powder, little bit of butter, add this to it, you get just a really complex butter that's perfect for your roasted corn during the summertime. It's also a really pretty plant, so in another month it's going to just be in full beautiful bloom, being visited all the time by hummingbirds. You're also seeing its full height right here, about two feet. Last week I talked about my favorite herb, lemon verbena. And I mentioned that there was a plant that made it red, the hibiscus. And so today I once again have my favorite tea, lemon verbena and hibiscus. And I have the plant that makes this tea this gorgeous ruby red color. So the lemon verbena tea tastes like lemon verbena, but it's got a little bit of tartness to it that's just wonderful. Almost a natural sweetness to it. So what is this plant? It is a hibiscus. It's not your normal hibiscus that you think about when you're in Hawaii or Mexico though. This is hibiscus septerif septerifida. So difficult one to say. So we'll just call it Roselle 
or as they know it in Mexican markets, Jamaica. So if you've ever had delicious Jamaica when you're at a Mexican restaurant, it's that deep ruby red um, tea that's very sweet. It is made with this plant and it's made with the flower. So hibiscus, this particular one, is probably native to Africa and there it grows as a perennial plant. It's moved all over the world though and so you'll see cultures using different parts of this plant. The leaves are oftentimes used in stir fry or as a salad if you're in Asia. The flowers are used all over the Caribbean and of course in Mexico and it's used for the calyx of the flower. So this one's blooming very early, it's May right now, and really we don't want it to be at its full bloom until October, but instead of pinching these off, I let these stay for right now because I wanted to be able to show you what the calyx would look like. So this is before the flower has opened. When it opens, it'll be a beautiful light yellow, typical looking hibiscus tropical flower. Then the flower falls off, and about a week after the flower falls off, it's a giant calyx that's that same red color, and you're actually able to peel that part off and dry it and use it for making tea. So it's beautiful when it finally does bloom. And then you can use the dried portion for all kinds of tea making. So just to show you what it's going to look like, this little plastic bag here, I've got some of the dried flowers all chopped up. Notice how dark red they are. They're just really lovely. This is completely uh, a good one for using if you have a cold because it's high in vitamin C. It has that great tart flavor to it. So it's one of those plants that it gets about four feet tall, about three feet wide, and traditionally it doesn't start blooming until towards the end of the season. So you're growing this plant and growing this plant and all of a sudden, uh, for us here in California, about late August, early September, when you've just about given up on it being anything but a green bush, it sends out these tall spikes covered with 20 to 30 of these calices, only now they're giant. They're about this big. And then huge flowers. And so they're just stunning in the fall garden. And then as the flowers fall out, you can harvest them and dry them and use them for cooking. Sometimes people will use them fresh um, and they'll candy them. You can candy the calyx. And I keep talking about the calyx because you're not gonna use the actual flower petals. You're using the little waxy portion that's at the base of the flower. That's the part that's used for cooking and for tea making. So it's called Roselle or Jamaica. You can eat the leaves. As the plant gets bigger, of course, it's a little too uh, bitter and, and large growing and waxy to eat the leaves. But when it's young, you can use it that way. And then you wait till you have those beautiful flowers. When the flowers are done, you can just pluck them right off, dry them, pull off that red part and use that for, um, for cooking. So again, hibiscus uh, vodka is one of the newest crazes. So you can buy this vodka that's got that beautiful ruby red color and it has that kind of tart yet kind of sweetness about it that the hibiscus has. So that's a really fun one. Again, I, I keep seeming to go back to adult libations, but a lot of these are really terrific to use for um, things like vodka. If you're uh, trying to get maybe a little Christmas present going, then start it in October or September, and you can have hibiscus flavored vodka for Christmas. So how awesome would that be for a little uh, Christmas martini, right? Easy to grow in full sun, average garden water. So we don't treat this as a real drought tolerant plant. You wanna water this in probably twice a week. And again, it's gonna get about this tall. It's big, so give it some space and give it lots of patience because it's not gonna look really beautiful until the end of the summer. Suddenly it comes into full bloom and you can harvest it for about two months then. It is an annual unless you're in a truly tropical climate. So if you're in Florida or perhaps Santa Barbara, you might be able to overwinter it there. Here, it does not overwinter, it's an annual. But the nice thing is, is that calyx that you dry, the seeds are inside, you can just save a few of those pods, save them till the next year, break them open, throw them into your garden and rake them in gently, and you can get your roselle started again. 
So again, love this while it is. This is a true annual in almost uh, all of our climates here but easy to grow. And it's the one plant here at the farm that in September, everybody goes to this plant to take a picture of it because they can't figure out what it is. They know it's a hibiscus, but they've never seen a hibiscus like this one. So really a beautiful and stunning plant in the garden. Continuing on with some of our Hispanic herbs. This is Chenopodium. Now Chenopodium, commonly known as Epizote, is uh, by some people considered a weed, um, but by most of us who uh, wanna make beans, this is a very classic and important herb to include in your garden. Epizote comes from an Aztec word meaning stinky plant. So with that in mind, yeah, to me it's kind of sweaty yeah, definitely has a sweaty smell. And if I were to just happen across this herb and not know how to cook with it, I would probably go, why would I grow this? It kind of looks like a weed. It's a lot, looks like a lot of things we actually rip out of the ground that are actually closely related to it. So what does epizote taste like? To me, epizote is truly a pungent, bitter plant. Yeah that has this unusual flavor that when you're first tasting it, many of us will go, I don't recognize that flavor at all. But if you start to think about uh, Mexican red sauces, burritos, uh, very rustic salsas, you will start to recognize that flavor of epizote. Epizote is a classic and important ingredient in Mexican cuisine, as well as Central American and South American cuisine. It's not a beautiful plant, as you can see here. It never is gonna be a beautiful plant, so you're truly growing this plant because you're going to be using it in your kitchen. It's also called worm seed because it used to be made into a tea medicinally to expel worms out of uh, the human body. So, and that bittering aspect, that kind of bitterness to it is a really classic reminder of that kind of medicinal use. So some people still use this for livestock to take care of worms, but for us, we're gonna use it for a more interesting and delicate means. And that is, this plant is known as the anti-flatulence plant. So if you're cooking up some beans, like some black beans, towards the end of cooking, you would add several leaves of epizote to your pot of beans so that for the last half hour or so, it's cooking with this epizote leaf. The reason is that it breaks down the chemicals in the beans that cause that problem with uh, making us gassy and it tends to make it much easier on our digestive system. Again, think of it, bitter is a good digestive also. So you want to include this flavor in with a lot of your cooking. This plant is super easy to grow. You grow it once, and if you're in a cold climate, it will die. But if you let it go to flower and seed a little bit, you'll have five, 10 million seed in the ground. So you're good to go for the next year, believe me. Or you can harvest it and keep that seed. It's a very joyous reseeder. In a climate like here in Northern California, it rarely dies all the way out. So this plant has been here three years. So it can easily take temperatures down into the low 20s. Um, it'll look ratty at the end of winter, but it comes back every year. You can grow it in full sun. You can grow it in a pot, although you see how big it wants to get. So you're gonna to wanna to give it some space. Um, again, if I was gonna do it in a container, I might add something pretty to it, some nice cascading nasturtiums or you know, some sort of a flower, maybe an edible flower like nasturtium or viola, so that um, you don't just have a big ugly looking weed because people might actually try to pull this out of your garden because of the way it looks. It's a super important herb though to include with all of your Mexican cooking. Even in quesadillas you will see it even added to cheese. But if you think beans, remember your epizote. Finally, we're gonna look at two plants that are commonly called za'atar. So za'atar is a Mideastern herb or combination of herbs that is used for cooking. 
So we talked about this particular plant a couple weeks ago when we were looking at our five essential herbs. This one is oregano and it's Syrian oregano. So I think you can really tell now that oregano is a flavor. Oregano is not a plant because we're covering it from so many continents. So this plant has these amazing flowers now that it didn't have a few weeks ago. Syrian oregano, Oregonum syriacum. I keep eating things that I, you can obviously tell I'm not a hot person, that are really spicy. This one's really spicy. Numbs the tongue very, very quickly, really quickly. Has a beautiful flower, and it will be visited by a lot of really wonderful pollinizers. So this is our really good case of where those of us that don't usually eat super spicy can eat the flowers. And the flowers, since they have that little bit of nectar, are always, for me, more palatable if it's something that's super hot. Very easy to grow. This plant, you see just in the last three weeks since we last photographed it, has grown a little bit and has just come into its full glorious bloom. If this was an annual, like the basil, of course, we'd be working on cutting off all those flowers, but it's not, it's a perennial. So you're not really going to be able to tell the difference between when it's blooming and when it's not blooming. So this is one of the plants that is commonly used to make up um, a za'atar blend or to use by itself for za'atar. Full sun, hot and dry, and extremely well-drained soil is necessary to have this plant be healthy. So this part of the garden here only gets watered once a week. So you notice we have things like the rosemary, the Greek oregano, um, our savories all in here, our thyme, things that can take super hot and dry, even our Italian oregano, things that just don't want lots and lots of water. Where it's native to, this may get no summer water at all. So it's really important to keep this in a dry part of the garden. So this is one of the plants that is commonly called za'atar. The last plant I want to talk about today is also commonly called za'atar. This is Thymbra spicata. And its common name is in fact za'atar, or it's called spiked uh, winter or spiked savory. So this plant has a great story behind how I got it. Um, many years ago, I went on a trip to Turkey to do some hiking in southern Turkey. And a chef from the Napa Valley said to me, oh, bring back some seeds so you can grow za'atar. I want za'atar to use for some of my cooking. So I'm like, okay, I'd never heard of za'atar at that time. So when I got to Istanbul, I went to the spice market and I found dried leaves, so I brought a whole pound of it, figuring maybe there was a seed in that pound of dried za'atar. Then I went hiking with a group, and every day we'd go out, and every day I'd look for this plant, because I at least was able to Google it to see what it was supposed to look like. Finally, on almost the last day, we hiked to this place called the Chimera, which is amazing because it's a natural phenomenon where literally flames shoot out of rocks. And so there's everybody in my group taking hundreds of pictures of flames shooting out of rocks because yeah, that's pretty cool stuff. Except for me, I was turned the opposite direction because I had found za'atar. And I was like, oh, look, look. And everyone looks over and sees this half dead plant because it's October and says, oh, uh, yeah, no big deal. Uh, look at the flames coming out of the rocks. But it was October. And I was super excited because not only had I found the plant, but I'd found some that had not only blooms, but old blooms, which means it had seeds. So some seeds magically went into a little pocket of mine and they made it all the way back to the US. And I've been growing this plant for about a dozen years since. It's a very unusual plant. It's long lived. It looks lovely. You can see it coming into full bloom right here. It is an astounding, amazing bloom. And it has a specific way it grows. So you remember I said that it was the chimera with a bunch of rocks and flames shooting out of them? What, the whole area was a rock area. And so I had to build kind of a rock garden in order to get the plant to survive. 
This is a 10 year old plant growing out of these rocks. So this plant, I know it looks a little scruffy, but 10 years, you've got to love something that's willing to make its way out for 10 years and it's getting ready to come out with these beautiful blooms. So Zatar, fine for spicata. This one has a very fine leaf. Obviously it likes super dry, it's growing out of rocks and it is super spicy. I mean, this is the spiciest one I've tasted today. So many, in many areas of Turkey and Syria, all the way down to Egypt, they grow this plant and they use this plant alone and they call it zatar. And so this is used much as we're kind of familiar with having olive oil and then putting all of our oregano and thyme into it and we dip our bread into that. The same is done with this plant with bread if you're in the Middle East. It's also used wonderfully for meats especially. Lamb and beef is used widely. It's also used for chicken. It's also used on the Turkish style of pizza that they make as one of their spices. It's really unusual, very spicy. And then I love to grow it because those flowers, and again, it's just week one, just starting to come into bloom. These flowers are astounding and they are huge honeybee attractors. So well worth growing. If you're going to grow it, you either want to grow it uh, in a rock garden, as you see I'm sitting at here, or you want to grow it in a succulent or cactus mix. So it needs to have excellent drainage. And a lot of times people mistakenly think that when I say it wants poor soil, that it, it wants clay soil. Because here in California, we've got that really hard clay. But by poor soil, I mean rocks. It wants soil that doesn't have any nutritive value whatsoever to it and it needs to drain very well, which we know that in the wintertime, those clay soils just sit there like Play-Doh and they are, don't drain. So if you put it into a regular soil, it's going to die, it's going to rot. So put it somewhere where it has to drain really well. It's well worth growing, first of all, because it's kind of a showstopper. I know this isn't the most beautiful specimen and I'm gonna actually add this to my rock garden. So I have a couple more newer varieties here out, uh, to uh, take cuttings from, but it's actually great to grow. And if you are interested in doing Middle Eastern cooking, this is a wonderful one. Even if you're gonna do a blend of zatar, which oftentimes uh, includes sesame seed and edible sumac and marjoram, um, you would still want to include this one in your blend because this is what's gonna give that blend a really wonderful punch. So this is kind of a fun one. It's probably one of the herbs that really gets the most notice here in the garden. People take pictures and then come up and say, what is this herb? I wanna grow it. Just remember, full sun, super dry. It's in an area that only gets watered about once every 14 to 21 days, depending, and it could go much drier. Where it was growing native, where the mama plant came from, the seeds from that plant, it was growing in an area that hadn't seen water since probably March. And it was October when I collected the seeds. So give it super dry conditions, but not heavy clay. Fun to grow and uh, really a showstopper in the garden. Now I know as we've been taking pictures here of this area, everyone's probably asking, what is this flower? It is stunning, isn't it? And next week it's gonna be even more in bloom. So if you wanna find out more about this flower, you have to join us next week for week six of our herb series, all about herbs. We're going to be talking about herbs that are unusual and somewhat difficult to grow, but worth having in the garden, especially if now you're kind of thinking, I wanna do some unusual herbs and be super cool. So this is gonna be one we'll talk about next week. If you've enjoyed this series, please share it with a friend. Visit us on our website, morningcenterfarm.com, for great ideas on recipes and all kinds of plants we grow and sell. Enjoy your herb garden this week, and we'll see you next week. The last plant I want to talk about today is another plant that's commonly called za'atar. This one is Thymbra spicata. 
<laughs> Spendus ficata zinasta. <laughs> it's a hybrid plant of a dog and a plant. <laughs> okay, where should I start from? Beginning. The, the beginning. <laughs> The last plant I'd like to talk about today. Oh <laughs> <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> the last plant I want to talk about today is another plant that's commonly called za'atar. <laughs> now she's attacking the camera person. <laughs> <laughs>